So for those who, who don't know, Article 6.4 under the Paris Agreement is um, basically establishes uh, the, the carbon market mechanism um, under the Paris Agreement. And, and it sets it up to essentially, in some ways, to be sort of the successor of the clean development mechanism, which was under the Kyoto Protocol and allowed for uh, the trading of of offsets and credits and so for say one country to pay for a project in another country uh and and for that to generate credits emissions reductions credits that could be that could be bought to offset um ongoing emissions and so article 6.4 sets up what for for lack of better words and based on the the wording in the paris agreement a sustainable development mechanism. And following um, in Glasgow in, in at COP26 in 2021, parties finally agreed on sort of the package of rules for all of Article 6, which have the carbon market mechanisms as well as a non-market mechanism. Um, and so since that happened, uh, part of what was done was that they set up a supervisory body that was to oversee um, basically the establishment of, of articles of the 6.4 mechanism to have rules of procedure um, and to define what sort of projects would take place and would be able to generate emissions reductions credits. That body met um, three times over the course of between July of 2022 and and COP27 happening in November. Um, and part of what they were mandated to do coming out of COP26 at the end of 2021 was to, in addition to developing rules of procedure, they were supposed to talk about recommendations on methodologies as well as recommendations on removals um, amongst a couple other things. And so they did that and, and that's what they started with and they, didn't end up being able to come to agreement on recommendations for methodologies, but they did put forward a series of recommendations on removals that they had adopted and agreed to um, in the middle of the night uh, on the day that COP27 was starting to then put forward to, to the, the CMA, which is the body that oversees the implementation of the Paris Agreement as part of the COP. Um, and so they put forward these, these recommendations on removals that typically then would be considered by this, this broader body, um, by the by the COP or the CMA, um, and essentially said, you know, for them to sort of say, thank you, great, and to, to stamp them and to move on and to accept them. Um, but what we saw from this, this supervisory body, which is comprised of, you know, 22 people, um, was really bad recommendations on removals. Um, and essentially what it did was uh, in a in a very broad decision and a very short one, uh, the definition of removals was open wide to everything under the sun. So it was land-based removals, it was engineering-based removals, it, it had mention of oceans. And so it really didn't close the door to anything, but instead opened the door to all manner of of removals in geoengineering technologies, you know, everything from direct air capture, um, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage to potentially, you know, ocean fertilization, um, which is, is problematic because there really is no other definition of removals um, within the climate regime or that we've seen in the Paris Agreement. And so this could potentially, you know, establish, establish what that meant and and essentially provide um, you know, the stamp of approval from, from basically the governing body for the international climate regime for these technologies and, and for these removals to, to be used to help countries meet their emissions reductions requirements. And so that was one concern of civil society. Other concerns included that also in those recommendations on removals, they put caveats on, you know, in, in language around um, not having, 
negative environmental and social risks or addressing negative environmental and social risks from potential removal activities, it put in caveats around um, respecting and protecting human rights um, for, for considering national circumstances. And so already put caveats that instead of having sort of a universal adherence to human rights, which is what's called for in the Glasgow decision, um, putting in caveats that would allow you know, countries that maybe didn't want to or or didn't have as strict rules on human rights to sort of disregard them. Um, and we know that a lot of these uh, projects that involve removals are likely to have severe um, impacts on human rights, including the rights of indigenous peoples. And so that was a major concern. Um, and, and lastly, uh, I would say another major concern was that you know, this 22 member supervisory body decided on this in the middle of the night. It is supposed to the supervisory body for the article 6.4 mechanism is, you know, has in place that the, the meetings are transparent. So they're webcast and they did have provisions for the participation of observers, including a space for interacting with observers. But in the end, they said, in the interest of time, we don't have time for this. So we're not going to be able to interact with observers. So there was really no participation. It wasn't an inclusive process. And what we see when there's not an inclusive process and not the stakeholder interaction is that they come up with these bad <laughs> decisions um, on removals. And so, so this was what was being discussed um, as part of Article 6.4 at the COP and, and facing a lot of pushback from civil society groups, from indigenous peoples, from women. Um, there was really sort of a cross constituency um, group of people expressing concerns and ultimately the negotiators themselves expressing concerns about, um, about this document that was, that was produced and about it not being, not actually being ready um, for, for adoption. And, and ultimately what we saw was the, the COP um, essentially thanking the supervisory body for, for the work they had done, but telling them to, to sort of do it again and to basically um, go back to the drawing board and reconsider the um, recommendations for removals and come up with a new, a new document. So over the course of this next year, um, for for adoption later. So it was a mixed bag. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, the decision was welcome to push it back uh, to for further consideration because adopting it at COP27 would have really been a, a problem. Um, and so the decision to push it back was welcomed by civil society. Um, as well as in that, in the decision, um, pushing it back, they included um, that there should be, they included the provisions for there to be uh, consultation or submissions from observers um, on the recommendations for removals and that those would be considered going forward and that, and that they wanted to make sure they were being responsive to concerns. Um, what I would say was was not welcome was that in in one of the versions that uh, we saw um, over the course of the two weeks was that they had put in language sort of giving greater guidance to the supervisory body. So rather than just saying, come up with these recommendations on removals and and keeping the same guidance they had before, which included, you know, needing to ensure that um, issues around um, permanence or avoidance and and some language on negative environmental and social risk, there was no, there was nothing in the guidance sort of related to human rights or the rights of indigenous peoples. And that was put in in an earlier draft and ultimately, um, you know, and it was in the draft, I think two days before the end and then in the penultimate draft and then in the ultimate final decision, all of that language on human rights was stripped out. And really that was something um, that, that civil society was calling for, um, for both the inclusion of explicit guidance related to, to human rights, including the rights of indigenous peoples, as well as for um, the recommendations on removals 
to not be considered just on their own, but to be considered as part of the broader governance package. Because it doesn't make any sense to have recommendations on removals if you then don't also have you know, the overall methodologies, if you don't have in place safeguards, if you don't have place the rules for the independent grievance process, because all of those things are needed for the mechanism to function. And so doing them in a piecemeal approach um, could lead to, to worse outcomes. Um, and so that wasn't included. And, and again, there had been sort of in place a, in an earlier draft, a a process of a two-year process to to consider um, the recommendations for removals as well as other things, not at COP28 at the end of 2023, but at COP29 at the end of 2024, um, which, which we saw as better. Um, and so not having in place this additional guidance and um, really is, is a bit concerning because it's telling the supervisory body, yes, you have to go back to the drawing board, but without any additional guidance, we run the risk of them doing the exact same thing. Um, and and so I would say it wasn't, it was not all good or all bad on, on how it came out, but there's definitely still concern. Yeah, so looking ahead, the, the main things to be aware of is that the supervisory body itself um, I believe has four meetings scheduled. I think the first one in March, and then they will meet alongside um, at the at the intersessional in Bonn in June. Um, and then I think they have another meeting in early fall, as well as they'll have one again just before uh, COP28 in Dubai. And, and as part of those meetings, they will certainly be discussing um, the recommendations on removals. All of those meetings should be um, transparent, and so they should be webcast. They should also be open to the participation of the observers, so that there should be people able to, to attend those meetings um, and hopefully uh, be in the same room and not in a separate room, which is what we saw in, in on the at the meeting on the eve of COP27, which was also bad for participation, and that there should be this participation um, of civil society in the supervisory body meetings, um, as well as there is a call for inputs on the recommendations on removals uh, with a deadline of March 15th. And so there's an opportunity for civil society to, to put forward in writing recommendations and submissions on, on how they think um, Article 6.4 should, should deal with removals. Um, and then all of that should be taken into consideration by the supervisory body who will then again um, theoretically agree to recommendations on removals um, as part of their work and put that forward um, for consideration at COP28 in, in the UAE. Yeah, so one of the other disappointing developments was that in the cover decision, as you've as you've mentioned, um, there was only a repeat of the language from Glasgow on the phase down of unabated coal power, um, which obviously is one very narrow part of it, um, whereas civil society was calling for a phase out of fossil fuels entirely, so of coal, oil, and gas, and to remove language around unabated. Um, so one way that this is is related is obviously, you know, putting in caveats around, um, you know, it being unabated coal opens the door for for carbon capture and storage, which is one part of what they're discussing in in Article six point four. But one thing to keep in mind is that removals are are not reductions, and putting, you know, and removals by carbon capture and storage on a coal plant or um, is not actually reducing emissions. It's just it's just creating emissions and having a, a bit fewer emissions than there would be otherwise. Um, and the other way that it's really linked is that you know one of the main concerns about Article Six Point Four in general and and an offset and having a carbon market is that it allows for the continuation of business as usual. And it allows for the continuation of fossil fuel emissions to 
to continue on the premise that you can continue to emit fossil, you can, you know, you can continue your fossil fuel emissions and pay for mitigation elsewhere or pay for, in this case, removals elsewhere, um, potentially, that you then use to offset your ongoing emissions. And so not calling, you know, not including that there needs to be this reduction of fossil fuels, which are the main drivers of climate change, is really is is missing the boat. Um, and if we have any hopes of staying below 1.5 degrees, we need to be concentrating on ending the drivers of climate change and ending reliance and on on fossil fuels and a phase out of fossil fuels, full stop, um, rather than you know, trying to develop rules or, or creating offset markets, because we're not, we're never going to be able to offset our way to keeping global temperature rise below 1.5. So I think there are, there are a few broader implications and a, and a few risks that, that are really highlighted, but by, by what has happened um, related to, to the discussions around article 6.4. Um, the first one I would say is is really looking at the participation angle. Um, and so, as I mentioned, um, the recommendations on removals were adopted in the middle of the night. Um, observers weren't in the room. They ended up canceling stakeholder engagement. And I think that really this is reflective of of broader concerns and of broader concerns we saw going into COP twenty six about the need for there to be um, respect for civic space and for it to be in, for climate negotiations themselves generally and and more broadly for for all of climate action to really be done through inclusive and transparent processes that include um the voices of civil society that include the voices of indigenous peoples that include the voices of women and youth and and all of those who are who are most impacted um because when you include uh, people in decision making, you lead to better outcomes, and and what we see here is that you know a terrible outcome through an exclusive process that civil society ultimately wasn't allowed to contribute adequately to, and that leads to really bad outcomes. Um, and so I think that's one lesson or or one implication that we see from this, and and one that shouldn't be replicated. Um, I think the other implications, as as sort of mentioned, are that. Um, if we end up with, you know, is that, you know, the carbon market generally and, and the mechanism under Article 6.4 does have the risk of undermining the integrity of the Paris Agreement. Because as I've mentioned, we're, we're not going to be able to offset our, our way to 1.5. And really what we need is real reductions, not techno fixes, not a focus on removals, um, because that's, that's not going to take us there. And so it runs, we run the risk of, of these removals or, or this mechanism distracting from what really needs to happen um, and providing an out or a caveat so that parties think that, you know, countries think that they can rely on um, technological fixes that don't exist at scale yet that will come with, you know, potential you know, huge risk to the environment and people um, rather than reducing emissions. And this risks overshooting the the goal of keeping global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees. And if we overshoot that goal, we don't know what happens. And we don't, and there are um, some aspects, you know, according to, to the IPCC in science, there are potential um, harms or things that will occur that we won't be able to come back from. So that even if we are able to, you know, overshoot 1.5 and come back a little bit, there are, there are harms that will have already occurred that we won't be able to reverse. Um, and so, so that I think is is the broader implication, and that if we focus, if we're focusing on on sort of removals, um, and on only phasing down unabated fossil fuels as opposed to phasing out all of fossil fuels immediately. And focusing really on only how, you know, after that phase out, you know, we then can enhance ambition through the market as opposed to as opposed to undermining it 
by merely having offsets, um, will we be able to will we be able to keep temperature rise below one point five, which is the goal, and and nothing should be distracting from that, and and these decisions and potentially introducing uh, geoengineering technologies or other false solutions distracts from that goal um, and what we really need to do, which is to phase out fossil fuels.